Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Hey there. Today we're chatting with James Sladek, who's the co founder of Tadero Robotics. Great conversation with James. We talk a little bit about the migration of Tadero from just systems integrator to also developing their own products. We talk a little bit about product market fit for that new product that they're building in the space of DNA purification. We talk about trends in life sciences and biotech in general and how Tadero is positioning themselves to take advantage of that. A little bit about the strategy of running a consulting company and product companies at the same time or a single company that does both. Pros and cons of that. And we talk a little bit about some of the struggles of launching a business where you're maybe not the smartest guy in the room, Uh, know a lot about business and how to build and run companies, but don't necessarily understand all the science and uh, how to come up to speed pretty quick doing that. James is an awesome guy. really enjoyed this conversation. I I truly hope you do as well. Uh, Find James and Tadero on social media. Thank him for coming on the podcast and thank you so much for listening. This episode is brought to you by Full Stack PEO. Most founders start companies because they figured out a better way to solve a problem or serve a need, not because they love tracking payroll, filling out compliance forms, and explaining employee benefits packages. And yet, all that stuff still has to be done. That's why there's Full Stack PEO. Full Stack PEO specializes in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just those core services, but advice and expertise that help founders maximize employee potential. Curious? Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. Welcome to the podcast. Today we have James Sladek, who's the co-founder at Tadero Robotics. James, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Nice to be with you. Why don't we open things up with a quick pitch for Tadero? Uh, what do you guys do? Okay. So we're a laboratory systems integrator for automation and robotics. And uh, that's a long-winded answer to the fact that we help biotech, pharma, and life science companies automate their experiments and their processes. And so, you know, we have clients all the way from, you know, little startups all the way to uh, companies like Eli Lilly. Awesome. And then I know, at least last time we talked, you were moving towards uh, manufacturing. Why don't you talk a little bit about, from a product development perspective, what you and the team are thinking? Sure. One of the things that has happened with uh, COVID and you know the entire biotech, pharma, life science segment is, like every business, is being hugely disrupted. And And so automation is a really hot thing. And also um, the processes that you're using in developing drugs and vaccines, a lot of things have been offshore. So, you know, the industry is going through a real change and automation robotics seem to be coming to the fore. And during this, we noticed that more and more of our clients and prospects were doing a process called, you know, DNA purification, which is a I guess from my research I've been doing is like a $3 billion segment of the, you know, pharma biotech uh, industry. And we kind of developed a a device that um, we're going to bring into market next year that will be a, uh, hopefully a competitive, uh, somewhat of a game changer in the DNA purification segment. And, how deeper i so i know it's still under development it's not in the market yet how much can you talk about that how many questions am i allowed to ask you about that you know you can ask questions because i'm not a technical person by nature i probably won't wouldn't be able to answer uh you know anything to give away the store so you can ask away all right right on so maybe unpack first, unpack DNA purification. What What is that and what would a device like the one you're creating do in that space? Well, that is an excellent question. And so DNA purification, let's use the specific example of, of COVID testing. So let's say you have a blood sample or a, you know, a saliva sample or a swab 
So that is going into to a testing uh, media. And what do you want? You want the DNA. You want to look for the DNA of the virus to see if you have it. And then if you do have it at what load. So in that case, DNA purification would be isolating the DNA of the virus and getting rid of everything else. So you want to identify and bind with the DNA in that sample of the virus if it's there. And then you want to amplify it so the machine, uh, the computers can count what's there. So, you know, this is a technology that's well developed. There's probably 20 different devices out there on the market from, you know, the biggest companies in the industry like Thermo Fisher and Agilent. But what our our device is, is uh, you might want to call it, we, we kind of cracked the code from a different uh, aspect. So we're going to be a, maybe a lower volume, more cost effective solution in that area. Lower volume and cost effective don't often go together. <laughs> cost uh, efficiencies normally come at scale. So unpack that statement a little bit. How, how would that work? Yeah. So, um, you know, the most prolific device on the market uh, right now is from Thermo Fisher. And, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, you could call that device about $50,000 plus bells and whistles, you know, let's say fifty to sixty thousand dollars. So um, you know, that that's a machine that can be used in any lab, that can be used in a lab that's doing, you know, a hundred or two hundred samples a day, and it can go all the way up to um, you know, thousands of samples a day. So our device would be less than half of that cost. I got it. And it's probably going to be good for all these applications that are in the hundreds of samples a day, which which meets a lot of people's needs. If you're a COVID testing lab, I mean, we have people that want to do 20,000, 30,000 samples a day. But if you're doing research or drug development or so forth, you're probably not going to be doing that kind of volume. I got it. Perfect. Uh, th thanks for breaking that down. So then started off in system integration. Is this the first product you guys are taking to market? This will be our first product. So, you know, our business here to four has been to work with the clients. They are doing uh, experiments. They're doing all sorts of things that include all sorts of equipment from, uh, you know, plate washers and sealers and and centrifuges, and we're taking uh, their experiments and we're uh, recommending equipment and putting together proposals to automate those experiments. So that's why we call ourselves a systems integrator because we would um, bring in robots, robotic arms specialized, you know, tables and grippers and plate hotels and all of that type of stuff and put together a system from them and then write the software to make everything, uh, the scheduling software as it's called, to make everything talk to each other and uh, to automate their processes. Got it. So I'm guessing the idea for this first product kind of came from that consulting work. So strategic question it do you envision continuing to do that kind of systems integration consulting work in the years to come as a as a means to continue to feed kind of like the the r d vision of hey what are the new things we should be building or do you envision as you release this product and potentially more products in the future you would do less and less of that you know the nice thing about doing the systems integration business is it exposes you to the labs, to the problems with the scientists, and, and it, it gives you the ideas and the um, insight into maybe where there is a niche in the market. So, you know, the systems integration business really feeds the, the idea that maybe there'll be a niche for a device or, or something that we could manufacture and be an adjunct. But, you know, I think the systems integration business, it's a big business in that 
all the labs that aren't automated now are looking to automate and and the space is very niche and very specialized there's no you know market dominant force out there so a little company like us we're only six employees can still you know do big clients like i mentioned i i neglected i i just jumped straight into kind of strategy talk i neglected to ask uh one of my normal questions paint a picture for the current company right now so you, you just said six employees any other vanity metrics or details you can share how long you've been around funding revenue like you know number of customers anything that for somebody who's listening paint a picture where you and the team are on the journey just to provide some context for the rest of the discussion yeah the company really started 2 years ago and uh, my my partner or as some people call him Mr. Robot because he's a scientist and a robotics engineer and a programmer, was well known in the industry. He was my neighbor and my dog walking friend. And so he showed me a robot he built in the garage. And I was like, hey, you know, uh, as a lifelong entrepreneur, I think I saw uh, the potential for a niche. And, and uh, that was the sort of the uh, catalyst to start the enterprise. And then, uh, so now, you know, fast forward to the end of 2020, you know, we're in the single digit uh, millions in revenue with six employees and, uh, you know, probably growing, you know, 50% a year. Dude, that's awesome. 50% a year is a good number. Yeah, it's, it's easy. It's easier to do when you're in the single digit millions than when you're, you know, <laughs> as you well know, you know, then math does not become your friend. Correct. <laughs> it, it's a, uh, it's a bell curve. It gets harder, not a bell curve. Uh, what am I looking for? It's a, uh, it's an exponential curve, right? It gets harder and harder to climb the slope. Well, yeah. And you know, like 50% growth when, you know, your $3 million company and 50% growth when you're a $10 million company is a whole nother animal. Indeed. When you think about, so there's a couple of ways to, to go about this and you've already, you've already done some of this. So this shows a little bit about competition, right? And the question I would normally ask is when you think of competitors, who or what comes to mind? And the answer for that is a little bit interesting, right? Because you've already kind of talked about, you know, for the specific product that, that you guys have coming out uh, around DNA purification, you, you've already outlined, you know, a couple of competitors there and how you're different. But are there other folks like you who are doing kind of a mix of systems integration as well as, you know, identifying market needs and coming out with product. Like if, if you were to try to pin down like an exact competitor, not not just others in the market that kind of float around that you compete with, could you do that? And you, and you don't have to name them, just trying to think if there are others out there like you. Yeah, that that um, is one of the really interesting parts of our industry is you know as i mentioned there's no real dominant player there you know there's companies that we really emulate and i have no trouble mentioning uh, a company called high res biosolutions they're uh, out of the east coast and you know they're about 155 employees and and you know uh, i would i would love to be them they manufacture devices they do systems integration they uh, you know, can handle twenty-five million dollar projects, and and uh, you know they they do just an unbelievable job, you know. And they have the giant booth at the trade shows, and you go in there, you're like, wow, this is so cool. So uh, you know, but in the in the scope of business overall, you know, uh, one hundred and fifty-five employees is is not. Um, a, a big company and right you know but they would be pretty sure is are the biggest player in our space so it's very very niched out and uh, i think the next one below them is like 35 employees so you know this has been traditionally one the segment really didn't exist until you know maybe eight or 10 years ago, and now it's really picking up speed. So you have a lot of sort of ex-lab guys, consultants, sort of one-man shows, because, you know, realistically, you're, you can, you're not, man, if you're not manufacturing, uh, you can just recommend to the guy, buy this, buy this, buy this, and I'll put it together for you. So, you know, you have 
you know, 10 or 20 guys out there in various places of the country that are doing it as, hey, I'm a consultant. I can tell you what to do here and, you know, help you put it together. And then, you know, let's call it five or eight little companies like us that are, um, you know, have uh, at least a nexus of, you know, a building and, and some infrastructure and some programmers and engineers that, you know, can put together a little bigger scope project. And then, uh, you know, the company I mentioned, High res and then, and then that's about it. And then everybody's going around and, and doing projects for, you know, Eli Lilly and Roche and, you know, some of these multi, multi-billion, 50, 70, 100,000 employee firms. So, you know, this is indicative of other trends and markets that, you know, we've seen over the last 10, 20 years in technology where uh, there's some disruption going on, but nobody's, you know, really dominated the playing field yet. So with that, uh, and that was a beautiful breakdown of the market. Thank you. Fast forward for me a little bit. So what does Tadaro look like five years from now? Boy, I noticed my front view is very hazy, but my rear view is 100%. Right? <laughs> I, I never, uh, uh, I don't know if I can even see out five years, but, you know, in three years, I, I could definitely, you know, I have projections through that. Uh, that phase and that is your regular run rate and, you know, your your growth and your numbers and your EBITDA and taking these products to market and, you know, maybe creating a couple of other adjunct pro um, products that support, you know, our thesis. What I've noticed in the 13 companies that I've started in the last 36 years is that, you know, I can never really set up the company for, you know, acquisition or whatever, that those things kind of s seem to have a life of their own. I just kind of try to take the business and, you know, and grow it and take advantage of the market opportunity. Like we're going to have it for, you know, I'm going to leave it to my kids and it's going to exist forever. And then maybe there's a, some strategery that could be done with a roll up. I, there's a, you know, this is something I've been involved with in other marketplaces where, you know, you put together three, five, uh, ten of the um, complementary companies in a segment and make, you know, a, a fairly substantial company and either take that public or, or present that as a acquisition candidate to, you know, one of the big players uh, in the space. So, James, are there any key pieces of swag at Tadero Robotics? Uh, anything for employees, clients, customers, anything you guys do that is special, unique? No, we just have the standard stuff, just like hats and shirts. That's like you, you know, there's no like Mr. DNA, like from uh, Jurassic Park I, that you branded and give to clients. Nothing cool like that. Well, um, we have an idea to do one and it would be uh, like a 3D printed model of a molecule. So we'll go to the customer and figure out what their uh, main thing that they work on. And then we will 3D print that molecule and give it to them with our name on it. Okay. You just went from the most boring answer to that question I've ever heard to the best answer to that question I've ever heard. That's amazing. Yeah. I came up with that and it's going to be really cool. Okay. That's pretty awesome. Uh, well, for those of you who don't need 3D printed custom molecules for your customers, you can find normal swag, the boring hats and t-shirts and things like that at uh, fuelmerchandise.com. Uh, and if you mention startup competitors, you'll get 10% off your first order. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> All right. I'm going to ask a quick series of questions that if this goes off the rails too much, we can delete this <laughs> and pretend like it never happened. But I'm super curious. So, you know, I think, you know, I'm involved in running a consulting company. And I, I think, you know, that we also uh, potentially spin off the software consulting company. We spin off software products, at least in our past. So I would say, you know, somewhat analogous to what you're doing in different space, but analogous in that you've got the kind of systems integration piece. And then when you identify market opportunity, at least now bu building out your first product, 
So the way we've always viewed that is organize them as separate companies, operate them as separate companies. If you if you need to move employees across those companies, great. And some of that's to limit you know legal risk, right? If if something ever happened in the consulting company, you wouldn't want that to necessarily flow through to products and and vice versa, right? So this kind of separations of concerns creates a, a nice little liability shield if you needed to. But the, the one that's even more interesting than a, than the liability shield is if you wanted to go raise money, it it's sometimes much easier for an investor to know what they're investing in if they're investing in a product company versus a consulting company. I would love to know to whatever extent you're you're open and able to to kind of talk about it, how you and the the team are viewing that from your perspective, because you know, you've obviously got the systems integration work. You're you know, if you're gonna be spinning out a series of products, hopefully knock on wood over the next three to five years. And, you know, hopefully some of those are, you know, profitable and and grow and potentially can, you know, even outpace the the work that you're doing today. How are you guys thinking about that in terms of structuring it, fundraising, you know, even organizing the team? Is there like, you know, another thing we learned early in the the company that we started is that when we when we did products in-house, there was like this sense of haves and have nots. Like, I want to be on the product team. I don't want to be in the consulting team because, you know, the product team is, you know, much more cool and exciting. So I know that was a long winding question, but how have you guys thought about that? And how are you planning to handle that as you grow? I have absolutely no idea. (laughs) (laughs) You know, um, I think the only thing that I'm I'm good at as an entrepreneur is is having a fairly good idea of knowing what I don't know. And what I don't know is the answer to that question, because there's so many variables and they're changing so rapidly that I could tell you that I have an idea. And, you know, I do. I mean, I've seen parts of this movie before. So, you know, I have a broad sketch in mind of, you know, how strategic tuck-ins go and, and, you know, some acquisitions and, and, you know, different companies are in different parts of their gestation. There's little companies in this business that, you know, have been around 20 years and 25 years and entrepreneurs are a certain age and they're looking for, you know, to be acquired or to do part of a transaction. But, you know, there's such a, a varying tableau right now of, you know, the marketplace uh, because of, this thing, I don't know if you heard of it, that's this uh, pandemic and it's really changed the laboratory business. We have customers where the labs, they don't, they're letting like 20% of the staff work in the lab. So they've got, let's say $50 million worth of equipment that's being utilized like one tenth of the percent. Oh. And uh, so, you know, some of that is staffing, pandemic, customer related. Some of it is you know, any, anybody that we would look at to be strategic partner, roll up candidate and so forth, they're all in uh, similar positions. Like one of these competitive pieces of equipment in our market, the reason we've developed our DNA purification is if you go to get that uh, market leading piece of equipment right now, they're quoting 12 month delivery. They, if you order today, you can get it next November. So that is wow. uh, that. That's quite a a change if you're operating a lab and looking for that. So, and of course, you know, there's obviously no used ones on the market because those would have been snapped up long ago. So, you know, I I think uh, business horizons and sort of strategic two, three, five year plans are you know getting a lot. You know, if if you have that answer really well. Um, worked out now, then um, I think it's going to change. So I tend to, you know, look at the short, medium and long and the long, you know, I have sort of a rough idea of what I'd like to, to create. And then, you know, just try to execute every day towards getting that plan. But you know how you get new information over the transom, you know, two or three times a day and it tra- changes your, your strategic horizon. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know that's never happened to you, but it happens to me. <laughs> this year more than more than most. Um okay, so well, perfect. Uh, thanks for the honest answer. I'd be super interested as you uh go down that path and learn some lessons there. I'd love to compare notes because I, I think it's something that we revisit 
on a regular basis in terms of, you know, what is this the right strategy? Are there other things we should be doing or thinking about? And it's, I, I know it happens a lot, you know, a lot is kind of in quotes, like in general, there's, there's lots of companies who do it, but you know, it, it you don't always get a chance to be connected directly with other people who kind of struggle with that, with that same problem and trying to think through the best way to handle it. Well, um, yeah, you won't be able to get rid of me. We have, uh, you know, <laughs> friends and connections and, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be picking your brain for, uh, for your uh, vision and, and uh, experience to chime in uh, on this um, tableau as it's getting painted. Well, that uh, that sounds awesome. Switch switch gears a little bit before I let you go. So, when you reflect back on the the last two years of of getting this company off the ground, what has been the biggest challenge? Mm, learning the business. I'm not a scientist and this uh, business is highly technical. You're dealing with microbiologists, biologists, geneticists on a daily basis. And those are the customers because they have to, uh, it's their experiments that we'd be automating. So I'm not a scientist at all. And uh, I didn't even graduate college. So that's been the biggest challenge for me is going into what's a highly technical industry with no technical background. And how have you compensated for that? Well, it just depends on who you ask. You know, well, not not how well. <laughs> how how have you? So is that uh, is that you just like you know cramming the night before a sales call? Is that you surrounding yourself with more technical folks? Is that like how how are you how are you coping with that? Well, I hope at this point in my business career, um, you know, somewhat of a fast study from, you know, learning enough to be dangerous, as yeah. we would say. And so um, my poor partner, who is the technical expert, he and I, our desks are, you know, 20 feet apart. And at least a few times a day, I'm like, hey, Tom, could you explain to me how this thing works and how that and at least a few times a week, my jaw is on the floor because I can't even believe that <laughs> it is possible to be done. And the science and the, the way the DNA is transferred in bacteria and uh, so forth. So th that has been the biggest challenge and also the biggest reward because, at, you know, at this phase of life to be learning life science stuff to this degree and seeing, you know, what's possible for, you know, humankind going forward with the uh, attack of the diseases and, and the chances to uh, break through with uh, cancer and all the drug development that's going on. And, you know, San Diego, where we are, is a big hotbed of, of that. There's over 600 biotech, life science, and pharma development companies here. Just being exposed to that has been... Uh, and so it's been the biggest challenge and the biggest reward at the same time. Nice. That's a very nice answer. So somewhat related, it, w it was not supposed to be, but it, it might be given that you're trying to learn so much of the space. Uh, if I checked in with you on a Saturday morning, what would you be doing for fun to unwind and maybe not think about work? Well, here in San Diego, we have the greatest weather in the country. So we're going to be outside on the beach or hopefully at least every other week on the golf course. And Tom and I bonded because we were dog walking friends and we have our dogs and we take them for long walks and hikes and and uh, anything outdoors without a cell phone is uh, is a refuge. I like the I like the caveat of without a cell phone. That seems to be a, a theme for me this week. Yeah, I need to I need to disconnect as as uh, at least uh, a few times a week because uh, it's it's getting you know because we don't see people in person anymore. So you know everybody is connected to their electronic devices more so than ever. Yeah. Sorry to be a, another one of those in your week. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, but this is work time. I'm in the middle of my work day here. And, and uh, you know, this is, a, this is a, a fun thing to do. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing it. 
Uh, if folks want to learn more about Tadara Robotics or if they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, that would be our website, tadararobotics.com, where you'll have you know some videos and some other you know stuff explaining who we are and what we do. Awesome. James, thank you so much, man. Well, it was a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.